All right, uh, let's see if we've got our, our bugs worked out here. Uh, welcome everybody to our, our virtual uh, peripheral neuropathy workshop. Uh, hated to go uh, in a virtual format, but uh, the weather just uh, really didn't allow to, to get everybody out into to the ice and, and so forth. We got on the roads a little bit earlier and um, they're better, but there's still some, some iffy stuff out there. So uh, hopefully you get the information that you're looking for about peripheral neuropathy here. A little um, housekeeping. Um, if you have a, a question you want to ask, um, uh, there's a thing down at the bottom, a Q&A, or at the top, depending on how your screen is set up, uh, that you can shoot a question. And I've got a couple of uh, moderators on who can uh, try to pass that on to me. Um, and if I don't get to those, uh, we'll certainly deal with them um, uh, at the conclusion. Um this evening or, or, or tomorrow. Uh, so feel free to ask those questions. During the process, normally on these workshops, what I do is I hand out a, uh, a worksheet. And the worksheet is simply uh, a way to keep me in line so I don't talk too much, uh, but it also helps. Um, there's some, some basic questions and some content that uh, we're gonna present. And it helps uh, people keep up with, with what I'm talking about. In this format, there's gonna be some some polls that I'm going to ask. So instead of giving you an actual piece of paper, since we're virtual, uh, those things will just pop up on the screen as we get to the information that's uh, normally in that worksheet. Um, at the end, uh, you'll probably see a little survey that pops up uh, just asking you um, a few questions. Uh, so make sure you stay on uh, at the conclusion uh, so that you can answer those. So as we get forward, um, let me... And I'm on a different computer, so if I seem uh, scattered, uh, I am. Uh, so uh, he here we go. Let's uh, just get started with this. Uh, so we're, we're talking about peripheral neuropathy. Come on, computer. There we go. And I know a lot of people with per peripheral neuropathy, it, it absolutely feels like there's pins and needles in, 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 your, in your feet. So I, I, I picked this picture. Um, I mean, as I look at that, uh, I promise that's not my feet, uh, just a picture that was on the web. And I'm going to be honest, though, that looks actually pretty real. Um, so uh, uh, with peripheral neuropathy, a couple of things. One, you either have all of that pain that that feels like, or the other side of it is you have so little sensation that you could do that to yourself and, and really not feel it. Either one is a bad problem uh, that needs to be addressed and dealt with. Um, so with this, I've got a few uh, web things that you can look at. Again, we talk about the third thing here, the worksheet. That worksheet is going to be uh, simply um, on some of the questions that we go through through the polls. If you would like to have an actual handout of that, uh, feel free to message us or email, however you want to do that. And we will uh, email that to you so that you can have that uh, for your, to, to look at. Uh, but there's a couple of other um web addresses I want to bring to your attention. One is one called freeneuropathyscreen.com. Uh, at the conclusion of this um, workshop, um, I'm going to offer, since you've listened to me, I may throw some jokes in there. They're not good. Um, I do my best, but that's that's what it is. Uh, for those that have put up with this hour, hopefully you get the information along with the bad jokes. But you've done that. I'm going to offer uh, to have you come in uh, and we just do a free screen to see what's going on and to see if we can help. Um, there's another one that's called uh, mypainworkshop.com. And likewise, if, if you don't get a chance to write these down uh, messages, we can get these over to you. Uh, mypainworkshop.com is a, is, a, is a link that takes you to a place where we list the dates of some of our other workshops that we do. Uh, we do this on free neuro, uh, on neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy. But we also do one on low back pain and sciatica, on the rotator cuff and the shoulder, as well as the knee. So if any of those interest you, you might uh, uh, go to mypainworkshop.com and that can give you uh, links to uh, when, when those things are scheduled if you want to attend those. So the, one of the first things that I ask people, um, and it doesn't matter if it's uh, peripheral neuropathy, whether it's uh, knee pain, shoulder pain, back pain, uh, what, what is the pain in this case, foot or hand pain? What have you had in the last 30 days? Um, I'll, I'll ask what was the activity that caused the foot or the hand pain and how bad was it on a scale of zero to 10? Uh, I'm fortunate that <clears throat> among many of the things that I do deal with, I, I don't uh, personally deal with peripheral neuropathy. So I get to say that I did, I had a, had zero pain uh, related to uh, neuropathy. 
Now, I do have some shoulder issues. I do have some low back issues. And over the past 30 days, uh, the shoulder has been good. Uh, the back uh, over the past probably two weeks, um, it's probably given me a little bit more problem than, than normal. Um, I will say uh, with how we treat um, all of these different issues, uh, the exercises that, that each of us should be doing on our own at home um, can, can really help. Uh, normally, I'm a good patient and I do my exercises. It takes about five minutes a day to do them. Uh, over the past couple of weeks, I've been kind of lazy. I've made excuses. And so I really didn't do them. And so I had a lot more uh, back pain. I've also spent a lot more time over the past couple of weeks uh, doing computer work. And the more that we sit, the, the worse it is on a, on a back, especially a back with the degenerative problems, which I have. Uh, so uh, for me, in the last 30 days, foot and hand pain, none. Uh, back pain, yes. Uh, and for me, that activity was, one, not doing my exercise. Two, uh, spending too much time sitting on my backside. So as we go through, think about your situation and what, uh, what your foot or your hand pain was like. Uh, we talk about a neuro peripheral neuropathy. We'll, we'll get to it in just a second. Actually, maybe the very next slide. Um, I'll, I'll come back to the foot and the hand thing. So who is who, who, who am I and why, why are you listening to me? Um, I, I, I need to come up with a better story about uh, my in quotes, peripheral neuropathy issue. Uh, mine was less peripheral neuropathy that we're discussing now, uh, but I had a, a situation, this was about three years ago, where uh, is, is the strangest thing, uh, after I would get out of the shower, I would, would dry my legs, uh, I would dry, so the weird thing is, if I dried uh, pushing the towel down on my, my lower leg, I was fine. If I pulled the leg, uh, the towel up, then I had excruciating pain in that, that area. Um, you know, I need a better story than that, but that's the one I have. Um, and, and I warned you that the jokes weren't great. So that that's kind of goes along with my story, but anyway, um, I, I, I developed a treatment for that. I identified a specific nerve that was uh, creating my problem. And we'll talk about uh, a little bit about what I did to, to treat that. And I haven't had a problem with it since. And um, that really is what led me on this path to a specific treatment approach for peripheral neuropathy. A little on my education, uh, I graduated from Texas Tech uh, in 1994. Uh, so that puts me at, uh, well, I'm going into 28 years now. Um, I went back uh, through um, MGH Institute in Boston and finished my doctorate uh, in physical therapy in 2012. Uh, some of my achievements, uh, I am the author and the uh, chief and clinical instructor for uh, the Haynes method of neuromuscular dry needling. Uh, short questions about that. People ask this frequently uh, because it is something that, that we use in conjunction for treatment of peripheral neuropathy. Uh, it, it, uh, dry needling is basically a form of acupuncture. Uh, we don't use traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, we don't look at your chi, your yin and your yang, uh, and anything like that. We look at specific anatomy. When it comes to peripheral neuropathy, we look at specific nerves uh, that aren't functioning properly and, and, and places where those nerves can be pinched or impinched. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, and from time to time, I, I uh, lecture uh, at the collegiate level. As a matter of fact, I've got uh, uh, teaching a, 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 a young group um, next week, I believe. Uh, and and uh, in Fort Worth, um, my clinical experience over 28 years, I've treated or supervised over a half a million patient treatments. Uh, as far as the dry needling, I've, I've treated over over 50,000 patients with that, uh, and I've been using this unique approach uh, for neuropathy uh, for about seven years now. Um, we've added the dry needling, which has helped uh, tremendously in the last uh, three to three to four. So, what are we going to cover today? Well, one. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, what is peripheral neuropathy? Let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, we'll talk about uh, how peripheral neuropathy or PN, how it feels, uh, the main types of peripheral neuropathy. Uh, what are the major causes? There are different things that can cause peripheral neuropathy um, and the treatment approaches that are commonly used. And then finally, what is our approach and how we might be able to help you? So what is peripheral neuropathy? Well, first let's divide all of our nerves in their two categories. Um, we have the central nervous system, which is comprised of the brain and spinal cord. Um, so when, when we have um, injury to uh, 
uh, the nerves in the brain or in the spinal cord. So we think of our uh, people who have spinal cord injuries. Those are those are permanent changes, and those are those can't really at this point in time with medicine where it is, we can't change that. Uh, with the brain, the brain still can't be changed, but uh, because of how the brain is structured, we can uh, say a person that's had a stroke with the right type of, uh, of rehab and therapy, uh, we can get the brain to rewire itself just a little bit so that those folks can make uh, some improvement. But on the right hand side of this screen, we look at what's called the peripheral nervous system. And, and basically just simply that's all of the nerves that come off of the spinal cord. And that covers everything uh, from, um, honestly, from the neck down. Uh, uh, cover it, it has a lot to do with uh, your ability to uh, to to expand and deflate your lungs uh, for everything that happens in uh, the upper arms uh, the upper arm the upper body the arms and in the legs so uh, the nice thing about peripheral neuropathy is there are actually ways that the peripheral ner nerves can uh, regenerate and if it's a mild it's a smaller amount of damage uh, they can be um, coaxed back into functioning properly. And so there's good hope for people dealing with peripheral neuropathy. Um, so what is peripheral neuropathy? This is where we're gonna get into our polls. So I've gone to the trouble of the things that are gonna pop up normally on the worksheet here in our polls are gonna be listed in, in red. Um, so uh, those are the things you're really gonna to wanna to pay attention to. So what is peripheral neuropathy? First, it, coming from the Latin neuro, uh, means nerve and pathy means suffering or disease. So neuropathy simply means nerve suffering or nerve disease. Uh, it is a broad term that has a lot of different uh, potential meanings, uh, but in its purest form, it's it's nerve disease or nerve suffering. Uh, it's a condition either to, due to injury or disease causes one or more of the peripheral nerves in the body. It's typically the legs and the arms to not work as they should. Uh, the peripheral nerves are responsible for sensations, and this is things such as pain, pressure, temporary, uh, temperature, or sensation, uh, as well as muscle function and movement. So the nerves that are going back and forth, sending information from uh, the, the, the body back and forth to the spinal cord up to the brain, uh, both controls all of those sensations that we feel, but it also uh, gives us our power for our legs to move, our arms to move. Uh, the fourth point here, there are more than 40 million people in the United States that suffer from peripheral neuropathy, and fully 8% of the entire world's population has it. Uh, there's lots of different degrees of peripheral neuropathy. Some are, are, are terribly bad. Uh, some are a little bit more mild in nature. Um, some are, uh, and we'll, we'll get to the causes in a moment, uh, but more than 40 million people in the U.S. suffer from that. Uh, diabetes is the biggest cause in developed countries. 50% uh, of people with diabetes will get peripheral neuropathy. Uh, we see a lot of people uh, with diabetes, especially if it's not controlled very well, uh, we find that um, uh, as they develop uh, peripheral neuropathy, then they'll also lose sensation, especially in the legs and the feet. Uh, and these are the folks when they can't feel something, they might uh, step on something sharp or, 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 or something like that. Uh, these are the folks that are, are more mo most concerned about uh, because they have the potential of having disease and injury in those extremities. And then they are more susceptible to, to needing to have um, amputation. And, and that's definitely something we want to try to avoid. Um, so in the U.S., the healthcare costs for uh, peripheral neuropathy. Um, well, healthcare costs in general over $4 billion each year. Um, and, and I have to go back. I'm pretty sure that's specific to peripheral neuropathy because I know we're spending a lot more than that in healthcare. Uh, and then at least 10% of people over the age of 40 uh, get neuropathy. 20% of patients receiving chemotherapy also um, get peripheral neuropathy. So what is, well, that's going to work better if I do this. All right. What is peripheral neuropathy? And this is a lot more technical than you have to know. As a matter of fact, let me come back because I want to. Do one more thing. All right. So bear with me. 
I need to give you our first poll. Um, here we go. Okay, so the first poll, first question here. Uh, what does the word neuropathy mean? Um, is it nerve? Is it suffering? Is it disease? Is it all of the above? I'll leave this on here for just a few seconds, give you a chance to, um, you should have an option of selecting an answer there. Uh, so feel free, throw your answers in there. Uh, I'll just leave that up just a few more seconds and, and then we'll move on. All right, I'm gonna end that. Technology is fantastic sometimes. Close that. Okay. Okay. So what what is peripheral neuropathy? Uh, let's talk about the types of nerve damage. This is not on the worksheet, uh, and this is this is a lot more information that you need to, than you would need. Uh, but there are basically three types of nerve damage. The first one is called neuropraxia, um, and there is a local myelin damage. It's usually secondary to compression. Uh, myelin is the um, the lining around the nerve. Um, the nerves really rely on that uh, to keep that nerve uh, functioning well, uh, healthy. It lets the signals move a lot better. Uh, here, there's usually just a little damage uh, there. Um, again, it's due to compression. Uh, there's something called axonic mesis. Here, um, the nerve damage uh, from either compression or crushing. Uh, it doesn't completely sever uh, that piece, but the surrounding sheath there um, uh, gets damaged to the point. But the nice thing is regeneration can take place there. Um, the last one is what we call neurotmesis. Here, there's complete physiological disruption of the entire nerve trunk. Um, and that's uh, whether uh, that's usually a laceration type of a situation. Uh, it's going to create a complete uh, lack of sensation. Uh, they're no longer going to be getting uh, impulses to uh, the hands, to the feet. And so we lose that. Uh, the nice thing is it can be regenerated there. If it's that bad, um, they regrow, nerves do regrow, but it's about the rate of about one inch per month. Uh, so if it's, uh, I'm going to use my hand. Well, I've used this as an example. So I, I had a, I was working on a, oh, a little higher. So right here at my finger, I was working on a uh, window frame. I was doing some work on it and I had a razor blade and then I was trimming some stuff. Well, I sliced through my finger. Um, it, it didn't hit enough of the nerve that I lost control of moving, but it did, it did hit the sensory nerve. And so I lost sensation from here out just on that side. Um, that said an inch per month. That thing actually probably had some other stuff going too, because it took a lot longer than that before I finally got full sensation back. Uh, so in my case, I had some neurotmesis. I probably had some axonotmesis as well. So mine was a little bit more complicated. And so why do I bring those up? Well, we look at this garden hose. Typically a nerve functions like a garden hose that's been left out in the sun. It's got a kink in it. Um, if it's, if it's got that kink nerves are basically just the tools that we have that conduct signals from the brain to the spinal cord, down to our fingers, our toes, our feet, our hands. Um, if that nerve is kinked like this, uh, whether, whether from compression, whether from the case of a bit completely severed, but, but, but mainly from being compressed, uh, the signal is going to be slowed or it's not going to come out at all. Uh, but similar to this garden hose, once we unkink that nerve. Once we release whatever is compressing that nerve, then the nerve can re return to functioning like normal. Um, so more often than not, it's um, that first and that second type uh, that we're talking about. Uh, and, and that's the that's the area that we try to, to improve upon is where that nerve is being compressed uh, so that that nerve can start doing its job better. Um, so we talked about the myelin sheath again, uh, just just kind of breaking down just a little bit, uh, and you don't need to you don't have to remember any of this. Uh, a nerve, there's a lots of components to a nerve, and this has exploded uh, to a huge uh, magnification. Um, 
the the actual nerve fibers themselves are down in the, the little blue thing in the bottom left corner, uh, the myelinated axon, uh, the thing that has the Schwann cell that it talks about there. Uh, everything past that is just different layers of protection uh, for for each individual nerve. And so uh, a lot of different fibers uh, help transmit these signals. And so what, again, over time, if these things stay compressed too long, then it creates more of a challenge for that nerve to send the signal. As you can see, there's blood vessels in there as well, compression of that. The blood, um, it, just like any other piece of the body, uh, relies on oxygenated blood uh, to help it function better. Uh, the veins have to be there uh, to help carry the, uh, the used blood back. And so uh, compression on these nerves is, uh, is the big uh, issue that, that really comprises what we do dealing with peripheral neuropathy. Um, some common symptoms of peripheral neuropathy, uh, numbness and tingling, and that's one of the biggest. Uh, it could be in the hands, the feet, the arms and the legs. Uh, it's, <coughs> excuse me, it's more common in, in, the, in the feet, uh, but there are uh, a significant number of people uh, who come in dealing with uh, issues in the hands. So my experience is uh, people that are dealing with peripheral neuropathy in the feet uh, de definitely tends to be more related to uh, diabetes. Uh, if it's in the hands, it still can be uh, from diabetes, but that tends to be where we see more issues related to uh, chemotherapy, um, even radiation, um, and, and different locations of nerve compression. Uh, we also, with uh, peripheral neuropathy, we have, especially with the feet, we have an inability to feel contact with the ground. Uh, pedals in the car. We talked uh, earlier about uh, uh, people with neuropathy of the feet. Well, they, they might be developing a sore on the bottom of the feet, but because their neuropathy is bad, they can't sense it. They don't know it. And um, that's why if, if anybody's a diabetic, um, at some point you should have been taught to do a daily uh, check of your, the bottoms of your feet to make sure that everything, um, the no sores, anything like that. We also have an abnormal sensitivity, um, such as inability, inability to tell whether something is hot or cold. Um, likewise, especially if there's a lot of uh, the issue with the hands, um, place your hand on a, on, a, on a hot skillet. You may not feel it and you may get a burn before you realize it. Um, don't have that as much anymore, but uh, uh, homes that have floor uh, heating grates, uh, if they get super hot, uh, you can walk on them on your bare feet. If you've got peripheral neuropathy, you may not know about it and you get, uh, you can get uh, burns because of that. Uh, you also can have a lot of pain. It's of often described as either a burning or a sharp or a throbbing <coughs> sensation. Um, because of, uh, especially with walking, uh, the loss of, or the diminished state of the, um, the sensation and, and the motor piece, uh, we can start to see, uh, clumsiness or de decreased coordination with that. Um, we tend to see more, uh, problems with falls. Falls are one of our big problems, um, um, regardless of age, but especially as we get a little bit older, uh, fall, the fall themselves is not uh, the big issue. It's um, if there's a fracture, if there's hospitalization, it's the things that can happen because of the immobility. So um, that's one of the big things with uh, neuropathy. Uh, we can see weakness or paralysis in the muscles of the legs uh, and or the arms and a feeling of imbalance on level or uneven surfaces. So you go outside, you try to walk out to uh, through the grass to get to the mailbox um, on those surfaces, that clumsiness or that feeling of imbalance can create even more of an issue. Uh, you also see potentially a need to use a cane walker or wheelchair uh, um, as this progresses uh, for safer mobility. So the main types um, of peripheral neuropathy, uh, peripheral neuropathy can affect e either one nerve or a small group of nerves. Uh, it's called a focal uh, neuropathy or a mono neuropathy uh, that often improves over time. Um, that's when you're going to see uh, more issues, say, on one side of the hand or one side of the foot, uh, specific toes, specific fingers. Uh, that, that's more often a mono neuropathy. And, and those are a lot easier to, um, to correct and address uh, over time. Um, then we have what we call polyneuropathy, and that's 
when there, there are multiple nerves and, and it can be on both sides of the body. Uh, here, this one's going to affect both uh, motor or, or strength of the ability to move the extremities and the sensory nerves or the sensation. Uh, this one only gets worse without expert treatment. Further, we have small fiber neuropathy. So the nerve, let's say the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve is basically the size of your, about the size of your thumb, maybe just a little bit smaller. And then obviously we think about the nerves in the thumb. They're super small, very tiny. Uh, so it's these smaller fiber neuropathies that, that we're talking about here. Uh, here, they are responsible for giving us just our sensation for pain, uh, for temperature, which is a diminished feeling to either hot or cold. Uh, it, uh, they affect our heart rate and our breathing. Um, and and the, the, uh, the bad thing here, these typically are not detected with nerve conduction studies. Um, so much smaller fibers. If, if anybody has gone through a, a nerve conduction study, uh, basically what they're trying to do is, is isolate which nerves uh, are providing the sensation or the twitch or the motor response out into the extremities. Um, and so they put the needles in and do all of these things. Uh, on the bigger nerve fibers, they, they can sense that. And then the, the equipment and the analysis throws that out there. On the, on the small fiber, frequently, it just doesn't pick it up. The, the, the nerves are just too small. Um, and then we do have the large fiber uh, neuropathy. These are responsible for our sensation of vibration, uh, for our proprioception, which proprioception is basically our internal GPS that gives us our uh, state of clumsiness, if that's an issue, and tripping over our own feet. Uh, it also, the large fibers are responsible for our motor control, or our, our strength. So if uh, those are affected, we start developing the weakness. Um, when those are involved, we also can have a sensation of pins and needles. So the short answer is peripheral neuropathy is bad. There's nothing good that I just said that uh, makes the person say, hey, let's, let's do some peripheral neuropathy. Uh, it, is, it is a bad situation. Um, it's a major cause of wounds and amputations. We talked about that with diabetics. Uh, it falls, especially among seniors. Uh, they're 20 times more likely to fall each year if you're dealing with neuropathy and six more time, times more likely to fall repeatedly. Uh, you know, I have folks come into the office and uh, they say that they've had several falls and um, they must just have strong bones because they haven't broken anything. Well, you keep following long enough and at, at some point in time, uh, it's going to catch up with you. We're just not, as we get older, designed to have these many falls without some sort of trauma uh, to the body. So falls are a big deal. Um, also responsible or a major cause of chronic pain, uh, lack of mobility and decreased health, um, depression, uh, peripheral neuropathy. It really can take like so many things. It can take the fun out of life. What are the major causes? Well, there are probably over a hundred proven cases of neuropathy. Uh, the major causes is diabetes and pre-diabetes. These are the biggest cause. Uh, chemotherapy. Um, I may not have it listed, but radiation uh, can also play in a role in, in that. Um, uh, other major causes, drugs, uh, statins, and antibiotics. We don't think about those, but those can be um, major causes of peripheral neuropathy as well. Um, and then chronic infections that can definitely uh, create issues related to uh, neuropathy. And then the full 25% of all peripheral neuropathy cases there's no known cause. We don't really know. It, it could be diabetes, but I, I think I'm seeing more people over the past few years coming in with neuropathy that are not diabetic, that have other issues um, that are the cause. Um, so you know, let me do my technological stuff here. I'm going to bring up another poll. This one. Oh, you know what? We have to do two polls. The first one, and I meant to correct this. So all of these answers down here say 220, 200. It's actually 440 or 400 million. Uh, the question is, how many people in the U.S. suffer from peripheral neuropathy? Is it, two, is it 4 million? Is it 40 million? Is it 400 million? Or is it none? Neuropathy is, made up by, uh, is a made-up disease by the big farm industry. Um, so that's a big question. And again, I'll leave that up there just a little bit. 
if my moderators can help me remember, I need to update that, uh, that figure. All right. And so I'm gonna end that and let's move to the third question is, what is the biggest cause of peripheral neuropathy? Is it diabetes, pre-diabetes, smoking, alcohol, or social media? And I'll give you a clue. There are multiple choices here, but they're just two that I'm looking for. Uh, as we're doing that, I'll kind of give the answer away. Um, smoking and alcohol can absolutely have, have a role in, in uh, peripheral neuropathy, um, but it's not near as big as a role as um, two of the other remaining three. So I'll leave that up there just a little bit longer. All right, let me pull that down. Okay. Uh, so some peripheral neuropathy pathological changes. Um, so regardless of the specific cause, peripheral neuropathy, neuropathy involves inflammation, oxidative stress to the cells, impair cell metabolism and function. Uh, in diabetic neuropathy, these progressive changes begin even before the diagnosis of diabetes. So a lot of people don't even realize they have uh, peripheral neuropathy until uh, it's well down the road and, and a lot of things are going on. Listen, we're human beings, which means we usually ignore uh, what's going on. Don't want to go see the doctor. Oh, it'll get better. And it's when it gets really bad that we finally decide to, to, to deal with something. Um, again, those specific things aren't, aren't anything that you have to remember, uh, but the inflammation um, and impaired cell function, that, that's a big thing with uh, peripheral neuropathy. Um, how is peripheral neuropathy diagnosed? So you have clinicians who are experienced and trained in peripheral neuropathy that can determine if you have uh, peripheral neuropathy and its probable cause. And some of the testing um, that they look at uh, reflexes, uh, your light touch sensation, uh, vibration sensations, uh, specific muscle function. We go through and we can test each muscle, each muscle group to determine if there's some specific weakness uh, in that muscle or the group. And that indicates to us if there is a specific nerve that is involved. Likewise, with, with sensation and vibration, we can use that to further isolate what's happening uh, and, and pinpoint specific nerves that are, are involved. We also look at uh, balance. Um, if there is a significant balance issue, uh, you know, is it because of uh, a dizziness problem? Is it because of um, an, an injury, say, to a knee or a hip or an ankle, uh, or is it more related to the function of the nerves? Um, pain. Um, um, there's always a detailed medical history. Uh, there's some proven tests uh, for peripheral neuropathy that we can conduct. And then we can go to uh, clinically, we can look at uh, EMG studies, nerve conduction studies. Um, I, I always talk to people. I want to be cautious whenever I look at any sort of um, of, of diagnostic studies, whether it's uh, these, whether it's uh, uh, radiology, x-ray, MRI, CT, um, all of these provide information, but without the rest of the examination, uh, we lose a lot of the information that tells us what we're looking for. You can have an EMG or a nerve conduction velocity test that says uh, this nerve isn't doing well, but it doesn't mean that uh, life is over and you have to just accept that what's going on and get on a bunch of meds. Um, it needs to be looked at a little bit closer to determine if there is uh, compression, uh, for example, in certain areas that uh, could be the actual culprit of, of what's going on. So what are the treatment approaches commonly used? Well, the drugs treatment. Uh, here, the drugs that are most used for pain of peripheral neuropathy. Um, and, and this is the most common uh, treatment right now, unfortunately, is, is drugs. So let's look at the three different types of, of drugs. And you can see that there are three in red here. One is antidepressants. Another is anticonvulsants. And then lastly is narcotics. So I don't see on any of the list of drugs here that, that indicate that they are drug or, or nerve specific drugs. Um, antidepressant doesn't have anything to do with neuropathy, nor does any convulsant. And any convulsant is uh, given for people who are having seizures. 
um, uh, narcotics. Um, so these can can decrease our sensation, but they're not focused on on the real problem that's going on. So let's come up to another poll here. So um, what? There we go. What are the three most common drugs prescribed uh, to peripheral neuropathy? To neuropathy sufferers. Uh, are they drugs that are uh, specifically to treat neuropathy? Are they the antidepressants, uh, the anticonvulsants, which are for seizures? Are they vitamins and minerals or are they narcotics or the opioids? And um, you know, we kind of touched based on all of those. Uh, there really are no drugs that are specifically designed for neuropathy, uh, which, which is sad, uh, but that makes us look at and think that we need to find other ways to deal with that. Okay, so let me... All right. So the treatment approach is most commonly used. Peripheral neuropathy drugs are not very good for dealing with peripheral neuropathy. Why? They're just not focused on dealing with the problem. Uh, they fail to address the underlying cause. They only mask the pain. They do not improve the sensory symptoms again in red, uh, they, their side effects tend to reduce balance and physical activity. Uh, again, very significant, unpleasant side effects. I mean, we've all read the, the side effects on different drugs and the ones that are used for peripheral neuropathy, the side effects are not good. Uh, they can have interactions with other drugs and specifically the, uh, the opioids. Um, obviously, they're very addictive. So um, my opinion, not a great choice just to, to jump to that treatment alone for um, what we're dealing with. So another, throw this out there. Um, what are the two biggest problems with peripheral neuropathy drugs? Um, one, they reduce balance and physical activity. Uh, they do not improve nerve sensory symptoms or drug companies don't want you to buy them. Um, the drug companies definitely want you to buy them without a doubt. Um, I could go on a soapbox about that, but uh, I'll, I'll try to avoid that. Okay, uh, so I'll leave that up there just a little bit longer uh, if anybody else wants to, to chime in there. All right, we'll end. Not very good. So some uh, some peripheral neuropathy drug side effects. Again, this is this is a very small um, list of them. If you've watched your drug commercials on television, um, they 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 spend the whole thirty minute long commercial telling you how bad these drugs are. Uh, but some of them for uh, the peripheral neuropathy drugs: uh, nausea, dry mouth, dizziness, blurred vision, uh, confusion, loss of memory, clumsiness, drowsiness, or low energy. Unusual weight loss or gain, uh, pain, constipation, insomnia, lack of sexual desire and sexual dysfunction, and suicidal thoughts. Um, if we can manage to not have any of those uh, uh, drug side effects, um, my opinion is let's 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 try another approach that doesn't involve that. Uh, at times they can be helpful, uh, but um, there has to be a better and there is a better active way to take care of this. So what do we do? Um, what uh, at, at, at my clinics, the Haynes PT treatment approach. Again, this is something that I've developed um, over an extended period of time. I've modified it uh, and we have had uh, very good success with our outcomes uh, dealing with peripheral neuropathy. Um, here, we've got to focus on your needs and health goals. It's drug free. It addresses the underlying causes of peripheral neuropathy. That's the inflammation, the oxidative stress, the impaired cell function. It improves your functional limitations, loss of peripheral neuropathy. And then there's different studies that have uh, proven published results uh, in the medical journals. Pain reduction, sensory improvement, better balance and reduced falls, improved sleep and quality of life. So our assessment, we talked a little bit earlier about the assessment, how we decide, how do we determine uh, the state or presence or absence of peripheral neuropathy? 
While here our assessment is designed to assess the extent of the neuropathy, determines if the patients qualify for our treatment. Is it is it peripheral neuropathy or is it radiculopathy? Radiculopathy tends to happen more uh, in the upper on the upper back, the lower neck, and in the lower back itself. Uh, we can have uh, nerves get compressed, specific nerves there, and it just uh, radiates pain down. It is very similar in nature to uh, peripheral neuropathy. Uh, radiculopathy is usually a little bit easier to treat simply because there's not all this other compression in the tissues further down into the lower extremity or the, the upper arm, lower arm hand. Um, the right assessment allows us to design the right treatment plan. Um, I'm not completely sure why that guy is there. I'm going to get him away. So with our peripheral neuropathy, we look at five systems. First, we look at uh, the integumentary system. That's your skin, your hair, your nails, things of that nature. These are important for us to know when we're looking to assess the extent of neuropathy. We look at the nervous system. Uh, here, we're going to look at uh, light touch, proprioception, or our internal GPS, uh, pressure, how your body responds to, to light pressure on the skin. Uh, we can look at vibration. That tells us how the body is perceiving that. Uh, we can look at temperature and then specific nerve pain. The third piece, we want to look at the musculoskeletal system. Here we want to know about the, your strength, specific muscle strength uh, in the hands and the arms and the feet and the legs. That tells us if there is an issue with specific nerves and what we need to go after. Uh, also flexibility and balance response, uh, especially in the lower extremities. If there is uh, a nerve issue, if there's some neuropathy going on, uh, that person is going to have a lot more problems with their balance than a person that's not dealing with that. We also want to look at the vascular system. Um, it's, it says lower leg circulation, but upper leg, upper, upper leg, uh, upper extremity, the hands as well. If we're having issues on, on the diagram, uh, we showed that uh, each nerve also has a blood supply, uh, vascular supply. Uh, so if that blood flow is compressed and comprised uh, somewhere along the course of that nerve, uh, then it's going to be a problem. So we can look further, uh, say, out in the fingernails and the toenails. We can look at uh, how that sat vascular system is operating to let us know what's happening. And then finally, our balance system. Uh, that's important uh, for uh, uh, assessing what's happening uh, as far as peripheral neuropathy. And so a very hard question coming up. How many systems do we check in our peripheral neuropathy evaluation? Um, is it three? Is it five? If it, is it seven or is it none? And drugs are the only thing that can help for anyone. Um, if you weren't paying attention, I'll let you know it's five. So, uh, and it's not drugs are the only help because drugs are not the only help. All right, close that, all right. So what is our three-step treatment protocol? Um, our, our treatment protocol is designed, first off, we want, we want to hit and get very aggressive in restoring normal function to the nerves themselves. Uh, we do that through step one. We use um, a, a well-established protocol of, of dry needling uh, to, number one, improve the function of the nerves, the signals going uh, from the brain and spinal cord down to the extremity and going back. Um, uh, people get very um, squeamish when it comes to, to dry needling. Um, they're, 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 they're super tiny. It, it's definitely not as bad as it sounds. Um, any, anybody that's gone through our peripheral neuropathy protocol and has had the dry needling done, well, number one, you're going to have a decrease in your sensation already. So odds are you're not going to feel it as much as somebody that's not dealing with it. So if you want to call that a plus, that's a plus. Uh, we also use a high powered laser. Uh, the laser is used in addition to the dry needling to target the, the blood flow and uh, the metabolic function of the tissue, specifically along the path of the nerves and the tissue around the nerves, different areas in the body that those nerves can come come compressed. There's specific locations along the path of that nerve all the way from all the way from the foot up to it's where it attaches into the spinal cord. Uh, so dry needling and laser is a huge piece of restoring normal function. That is that is, in my opinion, that's the easy stuff. 
and and people that that just do that uh, tend to have a decent outcome for a little bit of time. But that's not where you get your long term benefit. Where we get our long term benefit is step two and step three. Step two is a physical therapy exercise program. Why do we go through a physical therapy exercise program? Primarily, there are some specific exercises that need to be done for for the lower and the upper extremities uh, that that will target one, any area that we find that we have deficiency in in strength, in flexibility, and in function. So that piece has to be developed. And we also have to use that and get some consistency with that over a period of time in order to establish a routine. Um, I mentioned that I went for a couple of weeks without doing my exercises. Listen, we're all human beings. Uh, it takes, it takes almost, I think the number is 61 days to change a habit. Uh, if a person has ever tried to, to try a new diet, if they've tried uh, quitting smoking, quitting drinking, any of the habits that we have, it, it's hard to change that. And it's the same with exercise. Um, most of the time we think of exercise for losing weight and, and so forth. But, but when it comes to neuropathy, it's about having the right amount of exercise to the right muscles, the right structures in the body. And it's about developing a, a routine so that you do it three to five days a week at a minimum that you need to do these things. Um, our physical therapy program itself, uh, we tend to do, it's two days uh, a week for eight weeks. And then it's one day a week for four more weeks after that. So uh, that's three months of, of a commitment to changing your lifestyle of, of taking care of your problems. Um, we don't have to do as much um, on on our, our needling, our laser piece uh, during that, but establishing that routine, that's the critical piece. Uh, the step three is the diet and the lifestyle modification. Um, I, I can't stress enough um, the importance of diet. Uh, they're good foods, they're bad foods. Um, diet is incredibly important, especially if we're already in the midst of um, a, a case of peripheral neuropathy. Um, the body has to have those, uh, the right nutrients. I'm starting to sound like a commercial I see all the time. Um, but that is incredibly important. Um, with that, I mean, you consider that also lifestyle modification. I don't like to consider that we're going to jump on a yo-yo diet, but it really is changing your, your, your lifestyle. Uh, and so you'll see uh, step two, step three. Those are the things that's going to really make the, the long-term um, improvement here. Um, I don't, I don't want a person to come in and, and just do step one. If you just do step one, um, then you're going to be back again, uh, to deal with the pain, the, the, the tingling and so forth. Uh, that's not what I want. I'm, I, I want to teach you to do step two, step three, so that you can then be there, uh, for step three. <clears throat> I'm not a dietitian. I know that there are really good uh, resources out there and we have some available uh, on, on, on a good, uh, a good diet uh, for people that the diet is a big issue. There are services out there and we'll talk about them briefly uh, that can really help with uh, getting engaged with a, a diet counselor and so forth to, to get that uh, moving down the road. Okay. So one more question here. Um, how many, let's get that out there. How many stages are there in our, our peripheral neuropathy treatment? Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? Or again, is it drugs only? It is not drugs only. It better not be one because if it's one, it's just going to be temporary. We can use our, our techniques, our, our tools and, and knock that pain and sensation problem down. We can do it fairly quickly but it, we want it to stick. We've got to get that full step two and step three. So it's, that's a three-step approach. I apologize if this runs a little bit long. I tend to talk a bit much. So step one, dry needling and laser. Uh, dry needling is targeted to known locations of nerve entrapment. Here it reduces inflammation 
in the tissues causing pressure on the nerves. Uh, this stimulates and improves the signals going to and from the feet and the hands to the brain. Again, if we've got a kink in that garden hose, that signal is not going to get there. And so the dry needling is a, a incredibly important uh, treatment approach to, to kickstart this. Uh, step The other part of step one is our high-powered laser. laser. Uh, and it's targeted to each nerve pathway. Here, it improves micro, microcirculation to the nerve and the surrounding tissue. It reduces localized inflammation in the area. And it speeds healing at the cellular level. Incredibly uh, impressive tool. Uh, that, that can really help with uh, neuropathy. Step two is our physical therapy exercise program. Here, there are specific neuropathy exercise program designed by the physical therapist perform it, performed in clinic uh, with, with the physical therapist, and you have to do it at home. It's going to include certain uh, stretching and strengthening uh, exercises of specific muscles. They're going to be specific neurological mobilization exercises. So we're actually going to what we call floss these nerves back and forth across these areas of impingement or, or or through that garden hose that's that's kinked. So once we unkink that hose, now we've got to stretch those nerves back and forth. And there's very specific ways to do that. Uh, most people with especially lower extremity neuropathy deal with balance and dizziness problems. We're going to address those through some specific um, exercise. Our stretching and our strengthening program, uh, the nerves supply the muscles. So when the nerves aren't functioning as they should, Weakness and tightness are often the result. Uh, we'll work to strengthen those affected muscles, and we're going to restore normal muscle flexibility. Um, the specific neural the specific neurological mobilization exercises. These are the nerve glides. Uh, these things usually glide two to four millimeters. Uh, studying patients with diabetic peripheral neuropathy found the nerves uh, glided substantially less. Uh, two to four millimeters is not much, but if, if you have neuropathy, again, those tissues tend to tie down around that nerve, in which case we start to see that, that transmitting of that signal back and forth uh, decreased. Um, and this would affect the function of the nerve uh, supplying sensation and power. Uh, again, with the balance and the dizziness exercises, uh, what we're doing is looking to, to cut down our, our, our falls. Uh, lots of secondary complications from broken hips. Uh, the very high uh, mortality rate. On to step three, the diet and the lifestyle advice. Um, I mean, simply put, uh, you want to eat a diet rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, uh, lean uh, protein to keep the nerves healthy, uh, protect against uh, vitamin B12 deficiency by eating uh, meats, fish, eggs, low fat dairy foods, and fortified cereals. And I do have a sheet with all of this printed out. If you would like, um, like us to, to send that to you, uh, we can do that. Um, uh, your vitamin K. Regular exercise, incredibly important. Um, uh, with your doctors, uh, okay, try to get at least 30 minutes to one hour of exercise at least three times a week. Uh, as far as our stretching and our, ex uh, our other exercises that we do, those don't, la those don't necessarily take that long, but we definitely need to get that full 30 minutes, three to five times a week. And then avoid factors that may cause nerve damage, including repetitive motions, cramp positions, exposure to toxic chemicals, smoking, and overindulging in alcohol. So what to do after this program? Sorry, you can't see that, that picture. There's a, supposed to be a video that's funny, but again, I told you my jokes aren't that good. Uh, so neuropathy symptoms are much better or even gone. Fantastic. Uh, am I done dealing with my neuropathy? Is it is it um, one and done situation? I'm going to say that's it's how significant was the nerve damage? That's the question. But I will say that you you never fully completely finish being done with your peripheral neuropathy. As as we I say this carefully, as we put more more miles on the chassis, as we get a little bit older. Um, we're, we're not going to function as well as we did when we were in our 20s. Uh, you can see I've got a lot of gray. I'm not in that age group. Um, we have to, in order to keep this, this body functioning properly, we have to adopt a certain amount of targeted exercise that we have to do, whether that's for, again, shoulder pain, back pain, neck pain, knee pain. Uh, we have to do those things. Same thing with peripheral neuropathy. There are things that we're going to need to do. So after the program, absolutely, you have to continue with the exercise program. Uh, you want to improve and maintain a healthy diet and a lifestyle, and you want to monitor for signs of neuropathy. If those signs of uh, symptoms of neuropathy are coming back, 
uh, you have to ask yourself a few questions. One, am I consistent with my exercise routine? And am I adopting a good diet and, and lifestyle choices? Um, it may be time to get back on the diet and the exercise. Because if you've fallen off the wagon, if you're not doing those things anymore, get back on those things. They're specifically designed to address your specific issue with your neuropathy. Um, and if diet and exercise are on track, then it may be time for some maintenance options. Uh, so what are the maintenance options? What does this look like? Um, number one, I'd recommend following up treatment with PT, uh, either dry needling and laser. If you are already still doing uh, your exercises and your diet is on board, then we need to look at knocking that back down. Normally what I see is if we have a recurrence of symptoms, then it may be that there's other things that have happened. There's another nerve system that's involved. Uh, so that, um, that, that five point assessment that we go through probably need to, to go through that again, to see if it's just an exacerbation of the problem, or if there's other things going on. Uh, so follow up with treatment is, uh, is my first recommendation. There are three other things that I'm going to, I'm going to mention. I'm not necessarily going to recommend them. And quite honestly, because they cost money, um, uh, and they, they aren't payable by insurance. Number one is something called an anodyne. Number two is something called a rebuilder. Um, and lastly is a total neuropathy solution nutrition program. That's that diet, um, um, help that we talked about. So let's talk about those just briefly. Uh, the anodyne freedom um, is a, a unit that basically uses infrared therapy uh, to help relieve pain, sensation, decreases inflammation, oxidative stress, improves cell metabolism and function. Uh, it's just a simple unit uh, that applies um, that, that infrared therapy uh, to, the, they have it for upper, uh, it's more frequently used for the lower body. Um, the use of an anodyne can increase capillary blood flow. Again, blood flow is incredibly important. Uh, after 30 minutes, uh, they show up to a 3,200% increase, uh, especially in a more significantly compromised uh, extremity. Um, the, the benefits extend beyond uh, the, 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 the use of the anodyne, the Dowd cluster, and it can remain elevated for up to three hours. Little picture that shows... Um, a color graph of the bottom of, of somebody's foot uh, before treatment. Uh, the blue indicates lack of blood flow. There's a small little piece of, of red on, on the right side of the screen. Um, so before anodyne, that's what it looked like. After anodyne, that thing got a lot of blood flow going. Uh, three hours, you can see the problem is starting to come back. Um, but there's still some, some good benefit. Uh, so there, there's, there's definite benefits to use of this unit. Um, if you're not doing the exercise, if you're not following the diet piece, I would, I would recommend doing that piece first before you jump to purchase of this unit. If it's something that you're interested in, let me know. We'll see what we can do uh, to, to put you in contact with those folks. Uh, back about 10, 15 years ago, the anodyne was used very significantly for neuropathy. Uh, as we've worked more through the use of dry needling and the high-powered laser, we found that we combined those two with the exercise and the diet, and it's done a lot, lot better job, and it puts you in charge of what's going on. But anyway, for the use of the anodyne foot sensation, 97% of patients can expect improved foot sensation. Now, there's 60, 65% uh, improvement, pain relief, 20, 92% can expect some pain relief, 90% uh, get better balance and reduced fall risk. Um, again, one of the issues is that without being proactive in, in taking care of what's happening, you just may not see uh, the benefits that you want. Again, it's not my first level of what, what I recommend to people, but it's there. Uh, so the last question, by using anodyne infrared boot, what percent with improved sensation? Uh, was it 20? Was it 50? Was it 80? Was it 97? And if you weren't paying that much attention, I'll, I'll let you know it's the bottom one, full 97%. Uh, it starts to diminish after a little bit of time, uh, but you do get some improvement. And the nice thing about the anodyne, it can be used every day. Uh, so def definitely an option. It's, it's not my number one, but it's, it's something that is out there on the market. The Rebuilder 300 at home, I think they both have the same 300. I don't know what that's about. 
Um, again, it's indicated for uh, peripheral neuropathy, any of that lower extremity uh, pain that we deal with. And they're going to show a little picture of this. So I don't know if any of you have used uh, a, a TENS unit before, but uh, you can get them at uh, the Walgreens or what. You can buy them anywhere anymore. You used to, you had to have a doctor's prescription and so forth. Well, they've basically taken that and figured out how to place each electrode in this little foot bath and put the electrodes in, in, the, in the baths themselves. And basically you just provide stimulation to the lower extremity. Uh, again, it's not my first tier recommendation, uh, but uh, if, if I was having issues, I might give it a try. Um, our experience is we go through our three-step program and these aren't uh, necessary. I like to have other options out there. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna ballpark guess this, I could be wrong. I want to say the, that the anodyne is going to run a person. I'm, 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 I'm guessing here. I'm going to go to my moderator to see if she remembers. Um, I'm not even going to guess because I, I could be way off. Um, I've got it written down somewhere. If that's something that you're interested in, then I would go with our, our three-step program before I try to re rely on a passive uh, piece of equipment, but it's one of the things that are out there that are not drugs. So I'd recommend those before drugs any day of the week. Uh, similar to the anodyne, they have pictures indicating um, improvement in, 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 in blood flow before treatment versus after treatment. Um, finally, um, diet and lifestyle. Um, a, a specific program that's been created for, and this isn't me, uh, but a specific program that was created for uh, neuropathy. Uh, here are these folks, uh, uh, there are uh, dietitians uh, that have that developed this. Uh, you have your own dedicated health coach uh, that provides personalized attention and recommendations, um, the personalized coaching sessions, bi-weekly group sessions, nutritional supplements chosen specifically for you, uh, deliciously doable nutrition plans so you don't have to give up what you love. There's tips and tricks to help support your neuropathy-free lifestyle, uh, there's recipes and meals in there to plan, uh, recipe and meal plans to save you time. Uh, they have a VIP online support community, um, and it can all be done through uh, their uh, smartphone app. Uh, so if a person just is struggling horribly, uh, there's definitely uh, good advice, good programs out there uh, to help a person achieve, again, that step three, which is diet and lifestyle advice. If that is your big struggle, there are options out there. We could help guide you to what that, that could look like for you. Uh, most of us have a good idea of what we don't need to eat and what we do need to eat. Uh, it's just that we, uh, we don't do it. So, uh, but that's, that's, a, that's a big step three right there. So here's what to do next. My question is, your, is your neuropathy problem older than six weeks? Uh, if it's less than six weeks, it's probably more a radiculopathy problem. Uh, now, if you've got radiculopathy, let us take a look at that too, because that's one of the things that we can take care of quite easily. Um, uh, but if it's older than six weeks, then, then it may be past just a simple radiculopathy problem. Uh, with, with what's been going on, did you have a change in your motion or your strength? Uh, and more importantly, is the problem keeping you from doing what you want to do? If, if you said yes to those three pieces, I'm going to recommend uh, let's set up a, an evaluation and let's start treating your problem. Um, if your pain simply is annoying, but it's really not limiting what you do, uh, I'm going to recommend take advantage of the free screen that we offer and the recommendations uh, and start working on those things. Um, most people that have been dealing with this for a while, most of my workshop attendees, uh, it's already started to limit what you do. And so it's just a question of what do we do from here? So my offer, uh, you've listened to my, my half attempt at jokes. You've tolerated me running nine minutes long. Uh, so what I'm going to offer to to those who have listened to this thing virtually, uh, you get a, I'm going to offer you a free assessment, a free screen, free consultation. Uh, on the free consult, what we're going to do is we're going to look at certain movements. We're going to assess your body and determine what may be causing your neuropathy pain. We may not have the time in that free session to do the full five-step exam, but we're going to go through and, and get a, a close idea of what's going on, whether 
whether something is completely different happening or if you really are a candidate to go through the full program. Uh, is there something that can be done to heal it naturally? Uh, that will give you some tips on what that might look like. We'll give you the exercises and let you start on those. Um, at the end of it, if you decide that you want our help, then so be it. Uh, but I'm not going to try to sell you one. Uh, the whole goal here is just to give you the information on what's going on and what you can do to try to handle it. Um, again, my offer. So the free consultation or physical therapy evaluation. If we look at on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, free consultation, one, we're going to determine a potential cause. Uh, it, it's free. Again, it's going to take 15, 20 minutes. Um, we'll get a good idea of what successful treatment might look like. If we're going to do a physical therapy evaluation, uh, we're going to identify the cause. We're going to apply successful treatment. We're going to set up that plan of care to take care of the peripheral neuropathy. We're going to lay that out. Uh, that initial evaluation can last anywhere 45 minutes to an hour. And people ask me, what's the biggest difference? Uh, to be blunt, it's time and money. The, the free consultation is free. Uh, we stay really busy, so I don't dedicate just tons of time to these things. But again, everybody that listens to this workshop will, will find time to get you squeezed in. Um, what we really want to do is determine if that's an issue. If so, we want to get you signed up for just a full physical therapy evaluation. Um, to schedule a PT evaluation uh, or a free consultation, uh, well, please see the front. Didn't edit that. So if you want to do that, uh, in comments, then chat. There we go. Knew there was something. Uh, in the chat area, uh, send a little message. Let them know. Uh, you probably got here via email. If you want to just email them back and say, hey, that's interesting. I'm interested in a free screen or interesting in a, interested in a PT eval, uh, either through the chat or through uh, the email. Just let us know. And we'll start uh, making arrangements to, to get that taken care of. Um, so again, that's it. Um, did I have any questions I need to deal with? Okay, so a lot of times uh, the question comes down to, does insurance pay for what we do? Yes, insurance pays for what we do. The second question is, do I need a doctor's referral to do this? And the answer to that question, the state of Texas today is, it depends. Um, it depends on your insurance. And it depends on, that's really what it depends on. Um, ultimately, in Texas, for a short period of time, for a couple of weeks or so, uh, then we don't need a physician's referral. State of Texas legislature, uh, after that, if it's going to be prolonged treatment uh, and peripheral neuropathy is, yes, I'm not going to lie, um, we, we would need a, a, a referring physician uh, to continue down, down the length of this program. Uh, physicians are always perfectly fine with, with, with agreeing to, to the plan of care. So uh, that's never been an issue. We just have to have, just have that communication with, with your, with your doc. Uh, so uh, at the conclusion, there's going to be a little survey. So hang tight a little bit. Uh, once I end this, um, there's going to be some questions for you. If you have any other questions, feel free to email, let us know what they are. Um, and we can answer um, what we need to do. Um, if you have any questions, just yell and let us know. Thanks for coming on board, listening to us. Uh, stay safe, stay warm. And uh, if you don't have to get out tomorrow morning, don't. Um, otherwise, we hope to hear from you soon.